The whole time I'm doing that, like, I was feeling unfulfilled on the inside. Like, I'm smiling on the outside, but I was so unfulfilled just because I knew I was meant for more. Mm -hmm. I knew I could do more. Mm -hmm. I knew that what I embarked on, this entrepreneurship thing, like, I knew I'm, I was meant to do it. It's just I didn't, I, I just didn't have the right information. The top three responses that I get when I ask, why do you want to leave corporate America? Are that you want financial freedom, you want to own your own time, and you want to build a legacy for this generation and generations to come. Now, this is not a solo job. In order to transition from your nine to five into entrepreneurship, it's going to take community and it's going to take resources. And I've created the community of pioneers who are going to wrap around you and help you make that transition successfully. So if you're interested in leaving your job, go ahead and click that information below. Let's get into the community and let's transition from your nine to five into entrepreneurship successfully. Now let's get back to the episode. Welcome to the Work and Play Podcast. I'm your host, Arielle, but I'm here with Henry Amazing. Yes. Here to have a really dope conversation about self-actualization, life transition, and all of the in-between as we transition into entrepreneurship, yes. which I can't wait to get into that part of your story. So yes, yes. without further ado, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. What's up, everybody? I am Henry Goss Jr., better known as Henry Amazing. I'm an entrepreneur, speaker, author, I am a guy from Jackson, Mississippi that has a dream and is going for it. And I have zero doubt, belief in myself that I'm going to make it happen. Because that's the only option. Make it happen or make it happen. Make it happen or make it happen. It has to happen or has it happen. Thanks. So your brand, let's start with your brand. Okay. Amazing. Tell yes. me, how did, how did you come up with your brand, Amazing? So it's funny. It actually started in high school for me. Uh, my social media name at the time was like Henry sexy which is funny when i think about it because it was so cheesy but i was in the band so and i played the saxophone so henry sexy it, it just it just made sense right <laughs> but i knew um i was approaching like my senior year in high school and i knew at some point uh well after high school i, I knew i was gonna go to college and I'm, I'm really big on like branding myself because i just understand the power of having a personal brand but back then it was i just wanted a cool name I knew that wasn't going to get the girls in, in college, but um, <laughs> there was this guy on Twitter, and his name was Freddie Amazing, and he was like, um, well, in my opinion, one of the, like, uh, tweet that, tw uh, tweet, uh, tweet that, uh, tweeters where, you know, the popular recycled tweets, that's what will be oh, on his page, Okay. but it was the amazing name, it, it just stuck out to me, um, and... I was like, huh, let me let me try. Let me just switch my name. Let me do Henry Amazing. And I was blown away to see nobody ever used it. So yeah. for me, I was like, oh, let me go ahead and get my digital real estate. Like, so I went to Twitter, Instagram. Well, I was already on Twitter, but Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, just every platform possible to get that Henry Amazing username. And it's funny because it, it just started out as me wanting a cool sounding name. Mm -hmm. And then what it's grown into is just massive because in my senior year, people were just affirming me. They were like, hey, like you really are amazing. You, you are amazing. Like, cause I've always been just this honest, genuine, positive person. So when people saw that name, like Henry Amazing, they were like, man, that, that's true. Like you really are amazing. So I just took that and ran with it. I took it and ran with it. Wow. Okay. So what does amazing mean to you? Cause I mean, mm -hmm. Amazing can be a, dot, a lot of things to right. different people, but even you saying that people affirm the name mm -hmm. for you, what did amazing become a meaning for you? So to me, being amazing means that you're being your full, honest, true self, like your most authentic self, and you're not settling for average it, on any level, whether that's in your life, in your business, in your relationships with you know your partner, your spouse, or even with your friends or family. It's never settling for less than what you're meant to get because mm -hmm. we're all meant to be abundant not good not great not average but amazing and abundant so that's what it means to me i love it your brand is literally it's been a mission and it's, it's like been a yeah. part of you since high school yes. which a yes. lot of people can't even say that what made you you said you got the digital real estate. Did mm -hmm. you know that you were getting digital real estate at I that time? Okay. I didn't know, that. I didn't know it. <laughs> So what did you just say? So, I'm like, yeah. Uh, literally, I didn't 
fully understand just the power of what digital real estate was until probably like um, last year. Yeah. Um, it's been, well, yeah, it started last year because that's when, uh, I know like Brother Ben X, I heard him talk about it because he has a program about all that. Mm -hmm. And, but I guess even before then though, even before I knew about digital, digital real estate, I understood that if you have a brand like you want to make sure it's consistent on every platform because yeah. it, it just makes it easier for consumers to find you yeah. because the harder people have to work to find you, the more likely they're going to get distracted and go elsewhere. Yeah. So I just, I just knew for me, I wanted to make it simple and easy. So all I have to say is, hey, follow me at Henry Amazing. And they don't have to be like, on what? Yeah. Everything. Everything. <laughs> I wish I could say that. I had to get the Ariel Young underscore, but uh, I'm actually playing. You could probably help me with this because okay. I'm actually playing with a couple other names. It's just that I want it to be all encompassing and I don't yeah. want it to be limiting. Yes. So yes. I don't know. Yes. Maybe we can we can talk about a couple ideas that I've oh, had. Definitely. So, um, you know, what's funny is, so mm -hmm. people don't know this, but when we come on, you come on to the work and play podcast, I do say bring the notebook yes. because like <laughs> as a, so as the, the podcast, the um, message of the podcast evolved, mm -hmm. it came from me just having like crazy cool ideation conversations with my homies. Right. And every single time we started talking about creating a new, you know, empire mm -hmm. or, or impact or some type of um, community oriented thing. We'd be like, okay, let's get the paper out. Let's yeah, let's yeah. write it down. So you really brought yeah, your notebook. I did. I did. I brought my notebook. It's funny because this is at, like I used to work at Apple. Yeah. Um. At one point, I I was there for like a year. Well, a little bit under a year. Loved it. Loved the people. I love just the mission that Apple has when it, with just innovation and making sure that the customer gets like the best product. Just possible yeah but um this is actually from when i started there but i put my sticker on it uh with my logo because average yeah no average yeah. with the line through well, it not average because yeah. my man when people see the shirt i want them to like i want them to know that they're not average so the yeah. person wearing the shirt is you like you i'm not average right. but the people seeing the shirt you're not average either yeah so like stop minimizing your greatness stop yeah. settling for less stop yeah. Stop just being average because average people live average lives and they get just average stuff in this world. And you are meant to be amazing. You are abundant. One hundred percent. So as a um, as, so as a, the brand amazing mm -hmm. goes as an entrepreneur, how do you help your consumers? What is it specifically that you do for your consumers? All right. So for well, I'll say specifically. Well, the space I'm going to now is I'm going to help service-based entrepreneurs develop, launch, and grow their podcast so that they can grow their influence, build their business, and just build their impact. Because podcasts are, it's a, honestly, in my opinion, every person, every entrepreneur needs a podcast strictly because it allows you to connect with your consumer on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, people can consume your content on social media, mm -hmm. but, you know, if Lord forbid, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, they all went down tomorrow, you would still have a way to reach them. So, yeah, this that's what I do. Um, I also uh, help people just, ex I help them level up their social media so they can grow their digital presence mm -hmm. just because when you have a digital presence and you're able to produce shareable valuable content yeah. on a consistent basis yeah you don't have to worry about where you're gonna get your next customer you don't have to worry about you know the follower count yeah. all of that will come just yeah. because you built a presence where people can come daily to get value 100 percent. you speaking mm -hmm. really strong right now um one thing is you you are your podcast is amazing so i actually it's funny we're gonna be using amazing throughout this entire conversation so your podcast is amazing and i definitely i see your your growth as an influencer yeah. on social media so those two things you've already accomplished which makes sense that you're teaching other people how to do it mm -hmm. one of the things that you just said that um resonates with me um as i teach my clients how to go from employee to entrepreneur mm -hmm. is how to create that presence yeah. so when you think about creating that social media presence, mm -hmm. um, and you're currently still in corporate America, right? Right, right. I still work. 
a nine to five. Um, shout out to all the people that, you know, at my workplace that may see this. Hey, y'all. <laughs> hey, hey, guys. <laughs> what was your process when you started to create a, a whole like platform outside mm -hmm. of what you do up for nine to five? Yeah, so I'll say my journey actually started back in 2014. Okay. Just my entrepreneurial journey. Um, back then, I was on YouTube and I saw my first ever video of Gary Vee. You know, everybody, we, we love Gary Vee, Mr. Crushing It. Um, I saw his video and he was just talking about social media, the power of it, and just how you want to be present on social media. And I saw it, I was like, hmm, that looks cool. Mm -hmm. I, I, so, of course, you know how it is when you're on YouTube, you start watching more videos. Mm -hmm. And then I went from seeing the Gary Vee video to a video of Ty Lopez. And that's like his TED talk where he talks about how you want to get love, health, wealth, and happiness. Those are like the four pillars to live in the good life. Yeah. But to me, it's all about living an abundant life. But, you know. In those see, four areas, man. Yeah, in mm -hmm. those four areas. Mm -hmm. So seeing that, it just got my mind rolling. And then I started back reading books because I've always been a reader. Like my mom had me reading since I was four years old. But I took a break from uh, just reading for fun, just for whatever reason. But I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which every entrepreneur says, but it's so true. Like reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad changed my life because I read that book. Then I read The Cash Flow Quadrant. Okay. Then I read Retire Young, Retire Rich. And okay. all, all those books did was change my mindset. I stopped thinking like an employee, a person that just simply traded his time for money. I knew that I wanted to be on the right side of money as a business owner and investor because honest, honestly, in every book you read about building wealth and really creating the life you want, it, most people that build wealth in America, they either own businesses or they're investors. Mm. So it's like if every single book I read says, hey, the most successful people in the world, they own businesses and they invest. I, I should do that. I yeah. shouldn't just work the nine to five, okay. which I'm I'm not anti nine to five. Like I believe jobs are great, they, especially for new entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. because the job literally is your first source of in business income. Mm -hmm. Like you literally can leverage your job to pay for your business to help you get off the ground. Absolutely. So yeah. Two frames of mind. I say uh, your your job is your investor, mm -hmm. or your job is your client. Facts. Whichever way you want to look Facts. at it, that is how you are going to put 100% effort into your, your nine to five mm -hmm. and not to go into it with this mindset. Oh, this is just a job. This is just right. I can't wait till I leave here. So you started to shape your mindset starting in 2014. Mm, yeah. All the books that you were reading, yes. you started to come into this understanding that, OK, the successful people in this world, actually, they invest in themselves. They, they create a business. So I should do that, too. Exactly. How did you start to take action on that okay. what did that look like so the first thing i did was i started my first business in 2015 it was called amazing style so you know just tying it to the person <laughs> yeah so and it just i don't know why it just made sense to me but um uh, when i i guess i'll take it back to how i even thought to launch that business was i knew i wanted to start a business yeah. and i tried to i read a book the hundred dollar startup i recommend most people well i recommend everybody look at that book because it's very practical and shows you how you could get started okay. with something today but um read that book and in it it was just talking about the first business you do it should tie into something that you're already like either passionate about or you're very knowledgeable of and at that point in time i was an undergrad i had just crossed in like 2014 yeah, spring 2014, I crossed, and I was really into, like, men's fashion. Like, when it comes to suits, like, you couldn't touch me. I had the tie, the lapel flower, the pocket square, just the whole nine. Really? Like, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, <laughs> so, doing that, I was like, okay, style is probably what I should do. Like, selling the men's wear accessories, that, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And it's funny, because I started out trying to actually make the ties and the bow ties. Like, I actually got a sewing machine and tried to learn how to do it. It didn't work out for me. I, which, looking back, I probably should have just attempted it more, but I I didn't. It didn't work for me. So I was like, okay, what am I gonna do now? I, I wanna sell ties, I wanna sell both ties. How am I gonna get the product? And then that's when I realized, I learned about like AliExpress. So, and I learned just the whole process of 
where you can basically wholesale, buy stuff wholesale, yeah. sell for retail. Mm -hmm. And that was another game changer because it, it opened my eyes up to like the world and seeing how the world really works. Like yeah. the reason Walmart is Walmart is because they buy their items wholesale, just sell it for retail. Yeah. Like, and that's honestly what most, most people, well, most businesses do that. They buy their products and just mark it up. So I found a supplier and luckily, I, I know I got lucky because the very first people I tried out ended up being like, they were solid. Like it was yeah. a super seamless process. I literally remember my first big order I did from them, which it was big to me. Cause again, first what was time it? in entrepreneurship. So I had bought, uh, I think I bought like a package of ties. I think it was like 30 ties, uh, some some lapel flowers. And the, all together, I, I spent $300. But what I was able to make from that was insane. Like, prime example, which, I, it, this stuff, uh, I love it. So I was able to buy a necktie, like the neckties me and wear. Mm -hmm. I was able to get it for like less than $2 a tie. And I was selling it for like $20 yeah. retail. And then I, I would do a sale uh, sometimes where I will sell it for $10 or even five. But even at each price point, I was always getting a profit. So it was like, just having that success early on, it affirmed me that, okay, I can do this. I can do this uh, business stuff. Who are your clients? So it first started out, um, my frat brother, okay. to, you know, all the men in A5A. Um, nice. And I'll say back then, I like, which I, even now, I've always been a networker. So back in 2015, group me was really like popular cause mm -hmm. it was in its uh, beginning phases. Mm -hmm. So I was connected with um, people literally from all over the world. And I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. So to be able to be connected with people from New York, California, uh, where else, like Philadelphia, like just being able to have that reach and I'm in little old Mississippi or what people may consider little old Mississippi, it was powerful for me. Um, but they actually were my first clients. And then from there, I had the social proof that, hey, like people support my business. And for some reason, the way consumers work, they like they want to support you, but they want to make sure that other people are supporting you first. Because yeah. they don't, they don't. I guess they feel better. Trust um, that it's probably yeah. a trust thing. Yep. They're, you know, they, they trust the product that that someone else. It's like you you gonna go to a mechanic if especially if somebody recommends it, you. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's literally how I got started. Um, just my frat brothers uh, supporting me. I would say one thing I definitely want to encourage um, aspiring entrepreneurs to understand is that your family and your friends, they aren't your target audience. Ooh, they come aren't your on. Target market. So don't get mad at them mm. for not supporting you in the way you feel they should support you. Yeah. They support you by being your friend. They support you by being your family member. They support you by, you know, just being positive and affirming you and you know, telling you stuff to keep you going. Yeah. Just because they don't buy your product, that don't mean they don't support you. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's one thing, because I know a lot of people get discouraged when they first jump into entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, and they feel as though, oh, because you buy $200 Jordans, or oh, you buy that, you just bought that Gucci bag, yeah. why, why don't you buy my product? It ain't even the price of the Gucci or the Jordans. Yeah. But again, if, you're, if your family and friends are your target market, your target audience, then I, I'd argue that you don't have a sustainable business because your family and friends can only do so much for you. Absolutely. I would absolutely 100% mm -hmm. agree. Like people, the thing is that that family and friends, some people have the mindset, especially as a service based business. Yes. A lot of the advice that I got was, oh, well, just tell your friends that, you know, your friends are going to be your first client. Mm -hmm. And here you are trying to push a $1,600 product to people who exactly. look at you as, I saw you with issues in your own career. <laughs> you gonna help me with mine. And so, I think also, and I'm glad you brought that up yeah. because um, that's like one of the more like hot, that we're with the sixteen hundred dollar mm -hmm. um, program you have. Mm -hmm. That's getting towards like you know the high ticket, mm -hmm. and a lot. The reason you shouldn't just look towards your family and friends, or even just the people in your community, to support you. Well, not I mean to not 
to put patronize you. Yeah, to mm -hmm. not patronize you. Mm -hmm. Especially when you go high ticket, it's because most times when it comes to high ticket products or services, people don't have the belief in themselves that they are even valuable enough to get, like, invest in themselves yeah. to get that service. And then on top of that, they don't believe that they'll even follow through with the information they get. Yeah. So you can't take it personal. Yeah. You just have to understand that one, first off, make sure what you're offering the market is valuable yeah. first. Mm -hmm. And if it's valuable and you know it's going to help people, you won't have, like, yes, you will have to, you know, do the do the work in the on the back end, um, just making sure, you know, your marketing is tight, you got the right systems, you know, your funnels is set up and all that. Right, things. right. But you, you will find your audience mm -hmm. because there are people looking for what you provide. They need you. Yes. And Whew. you have to be clear. Like, clarity is such a big thing because if you feel as though your product and service is for everybody, it's not for anybody. Ooh, kill it. Like, for real. Like, and just, like, for instance, I like your, your shirt, which, shout out to, uh... David, David Sands, Sands in the morning. Sands. morning. Yes. Shout out to the morning meetup. <laughs> but, uh, like, his shirt, entrepreneur. Mm hmm Sure, anybody can wear that shirt. But he's not marketing to everybody. Right. He's marketing to entrepreneurs, people who have a dream that they are willing to lose sleep over yeah. to make happen. Kill it. So tell me this. Your first entrepreneurial endeavor mm -hmm. was um, your teach your your um yeah, the accessories. Yeah, accessories. Thank yeah. you. Um, and your clients were your fat brothers and college students. I'm mm -hmm. curious about a lot in that. Okay. So I'm gonna try to we're gonna I'm gonna try to keep um, our storyline together. Okay. Because I'm still trying to understand. Okay, so that was your first entrepreneurial endeavor. Mm -hmm. But then, of, of course, we know at some point you went on to have a nine to five. Right. So what was your journey? So um, when I first started my first entrepreneurial endeavor, I was actually working at the movie theater, making seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. Mm -hmm. And at the movie theater, I was actually there for five years from 2013 to 2018. But um, in those years, I learned how to do everything at that job, like, you know, Sweeping up the popcorn, selling the concessions, selling the tickets, the whole nine. Mm -hmm. And what it did, and although I was an undergrad at the same time, what working that job did was showed me that, like, just trading my time for money forever. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they call it like the 40, 40, 40 plan. You know, you work 40 hours a week for 40 years of your life to live on 40% of your pay. Ooh. I knew that wasn't the route for me. I knew I could not get the life I wanted just simply doing that. So, um, just the, having that in mind was always the fuel in my entrepreneurial journey. Because um, I ended up, of course, elevating from the movie theater. I went and worked in uh, telesales where I was selling uh, phones at Sprint. Left there, I worked as an assistant manager for a pool store, making $12 an hour. And it's funny because back then, I was oh my gosh, Twelve dollars an hour. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm just, oh, I'm lit, killing it. Yeah. And I still was living um, at home with my parents, which I'm so grateful for them because they've always been uh, supportive of me in my endeavors. But um, after the assistant manager job, I ended up um, leaving there to work at a nonprofit. Um, which shout out to S R One because they taught me so much and just helped me become just a better person yeah. overall. So I'll, I'll forever champion them. But after the nine, well, while I was at the nonprofit, I, this, I started working at Apple. And then after Apple, I left the nonprofit and Apple to go work my first, like, true nine to five. Because mm. before then, and I started the nine to five um, last year um, in July of 2020. But it's like, before then, I was working, I was always working like two part time jobs. Mm. So, Keeping in mind what I learned at the movie theater, like trading my time for money isn't sustainable. Like it's not what, or at least for me, for Henry, is not the best route. Seeing that and then realizing like, man, I'm working all these hours. I'm working like two places and it's still not enough. Like it, for me, I was making just enough to like not be broke, which, I don't even like using the word broke because I look, I, just my, the way my mindset is set up, mm -hmm. no one is broke. We're just waiting on our, we're, we're just waiting on our blessing. Absolutely. Like, and it, especially for me, because I, I believe and I know for a fact, I'm already a multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So, and I'm just waiting on the millions to show up in my account. So just having all of that in mind, that's what, that's what helps me and fuels me to go even entrepreneurial endeavors mm -hmm. because it's like, yes, the job gives me the money to get my stuff off the ground, mm -hmm. but I understand to truly maximize what I'm trying to do for me. Again, I have, I always do the disclaimer because everybody is different, but for me, just simply working a nine to five is not, it's not an option for me. Right. Because I know I'm meant for more. And I know that a job will never, ever, ever pay me my work. Absolutely. Because, it, like, honestly, when you look at business, no, if if businesses pay people their work, then their the, what they charge for their products and services mm -hmm. would be through the roof. Because mm -hmm. how, like, I'll put it like this. Let's say I worked for um, a sales company, right? And I generate, like, a million dollars in sales for them throughout the course of my career, they aren't gonna pay me a million dollars. Mm. They'll never pay me a million dollars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They'll pay, like, I, I'll probably, you know, eventually get promoted and get paid nicely, but it's like, how do you pay a person that does so much, like, does so well? Yeah, absolutely. And, and those are the type of questions that were, like, going in my head. That's one way to look at it, but it, it's like this, if, if you, if one, if only one of your clients mm -hmm. pays you eighty thousand dollars a year, then you should really be thinking about other clients. But for some reason, we think our corporate job has to be our only client. Yes. That the other thing is, when you know that hey, I can make your business a million dollars, that means you start to realize that your value is 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 extrapolated. So I think one, it helps the nine to five or the job seeker mm -hmm. know how to negotiate in those those salary negotiation mm -hmm. conversations. But I also think as an entrepreneur, we now know how to um, communicate our value to multiple yes. different clients. Even if you have your nine to five, I think mm -hmm. instead of thinking so, because if I'm if I'm working for a company, I'm probably always going to make them more money than right. they pay me because I'm a I'm an expense. Exactly. Right. But I think um, what, what you're saying as you're talking about this mindset work, um, I think that's just I like to that's another way I like to, to, to think about it right. as we think about what, what our nine to five um, really does for us. Right. You know what I mean? And I say it's, it's just the way God works is so just funny and incredible. But um, literally on my way here, yeah. um, I saw a video by Derek Grace, which shout out to him, the game he gives out. It's just amazing, but um, he was just speaking on like people that work the nine to five, like how they can leverage it for and get more from the job than just the paycheck, which is uh, another gem I learned from Dave's book. You know, um, shoot, Dang. I know it. Dang. Built dreams are built yeah, overnight. Are built <laughs> overnight. How to work your day job and while building your day dream, mm -hmm. but. Um, and basically what Derek Grace was saying is that if you are working in your job, you should do three things. You should infiltrate, educate, and then vacate. So basically you should get in the nine to five, and then once you're in and you you know, you know get that cash flow from them, educate yourself. Learn as much as you can yes. from that job. And then once you put yourself in position to where you can you know, leave and you got a plan of action mm -hmm. and you know, a proven success, and what you're trying to do, yeah. then vacate. Yeah. So tell me this. You went from the accessories. Mm -hmm. um, oh, to, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, what was your yeah. entrepreneurial yeah. Endeavor, yeah. So, endeavor while you were right, there? So started out with Amazing Style, some of the men's were accessories. Did that for like, um, I want to say like maybe two years, mm -hmm. and I stopped it. Amazing Style. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that was Amazing Style. Mm -hmm. Then next, um, I went into amazing apparel okay. so that was the first time i did a t-shirt brand okay and the method i used was print on demand because i had zero like and it's funny because typically all the businesses i start i start with zero which hmm. i understand uh the power in just having capital to invest in your endeavor but for some reason i just work better starting from zero because it it makes me more create like i think more okay. because i start from nothing but um I did amazing apparel where I sold t-shirts and at the time that was like 2017 I want to say yeah so that was about 2017 and I did that from 2017 to 2019 but the shirt design it had black educated and dope AF 
And at that point in time, like the everybody was really pro black. Like they were really like I'm still like, are. I'm, yeah. Which, which, yeah. <laughs> you know, we are. You know, shout out to um, my brothers and sisters. Yeah. But I don't know. It's just everybody was more unapologetic. Or at that time, it felt that everybody was more unapologetic. Like the movie Black Panther had came out, and mm. people were buying my shirt mm-hmm. to wear it to while they went to go see it. I remember one of the most defining moments for that brand was it was some med students um, at uh, UMMC, like. I think it was like 10 or 15 of them all went to go see Black Panther. They took a picture in the shirt and like my business like boom uh, after that. And it was really cool because it again, it taught me like, hey, I can do this business stuff. Yeah. Like, I can, you know, I can put something out to the market and, you know, they receive it and support it. So that was really good. Now, I will say after the T-shirt business started to decline, I hit like a roadblock in my journey. Well, I want to, well, back then I thought it was a roadblock, but now I understand it was just a speed bump on my journey mm-hmm. to success. What but um, I, I developed a, a really bad case of imposter syndrome. Okay. So, so was it the success of your t shirt brand? It wasn't the success of the t shirt brand. It was just, again, my just thirst for knowledge and me, like the people I were inspired by were like Gary Vee. Ty Lopez, you mm-hmm. know, David Shands, like yeah. people that were crushing it and, you know, making six, seven, eight figures. And I had, I hit a point where I thought that I was not valuable or that I wasn't qualified to be an entrepreneur mm. or to provide value to the world because I didn't have the six, seven or eight figures. Yeah. And it, it took me to a point where I basically fell off the face of the earth for like, two years honestly Mm -hmm. um so between 2019 and the beginning part of 2020 i like i wasn't being consistent on social media at all like i would barely post the the luckily um in 2020 i met my wife so that they got me back into the process of like sharing Mm -hmm. my stuff like just sharing stuff about myself again Mm -hmm. because i don't know i just really felt that and then also um within me doing the businesses i started trying to podcast so i launched the amazing podcast for the first time in 2018 i did seven episodes and then fell off okay was that also due to imposter syndrome that wasn't due to the imposter syndrome Mm -hmm. it was i didn't understand how to i didn't understand what all I needed to do and just having like I didn't understand the systems I needed in place or just literally making a workflow that was sustainable um but I I had the guests Mm -hmm. like and the people um that came on and gave value but Mm -hmm. and I would say honestly what truly messed me up back then was I didn't understand how to edit okay and so and I was doing every with the first podcast well the first time I did it I was doing everything off my cell phone. Okay. So I did use like the Anchor app. Mm-hmm. And I was recording on my phone, but and I was editing in another app. I don't even remember the name now. But uh, just when I fell off from that, it like it was like, oh dang man, I I really wanted to do this, but it feels like I failed. Like and I for me, I've always been a high achiever. Like you know, coming through school. On a roll, high on a roll. Like mm-hmm. I've always been, like I've always been uh, excelling at the highest level. So mm-hmm. for me to like not be successful in something, it like really hit hard. Yeah. But you know, I dusted myself off um, from the first L with the podcast, and I was like, okay, 2019, I'm coming back harder than ever. I'm gonna do it right. So what I did was because I only had seven episodes, I was like, this time I'm gonna get. Uh, a whole lot and have them in the vault and I'll just edit as I go. Yeah. I ended up having like 10 episodes in my vault um, that's still unreleased to this day, which is funny. But um, I recorded the 10 episodes, but I only released one. Okay. Why is that? I still didn't know how to edit. Okay. <laughs> so- I still didn't know how to edit, <laughs> which you would think if I know that this is the one task that's my toughest. I should just outsource it. Yeah. But it, I, don't, I don't even know why um, I had an issue with, you know, seeking out help. But, well, 
Mm. I'll say just because I know my capacity, mm-hmm. my potential, I know that I can do. Like I, I understand just what I'm able to do. So I, I believe that's probably why I, I still didn't reach out to someone about and, that. Right. Yeah, I, I, I definitely have. Um, I resonate with that when it comes to. Um, not it, it, sometimes it could be struggling at something that I know I'm not good at, but then it's something that sometimes I will spend effort and, and blood, sweat, and tears to learn something I'm not good at, and it just takes so much out of me. Yeah. And I might even do it well, but I would then I would then I would be re- releasing all the good energy that I could be doing something I'm good at. <laughs> and I'm yeah. focusing on this. So um, there's a couple of things that I'm really curious about okay. because when you were telling me that. Um, your sales went up in the t-shirt business mm-hmm. um, and then you got really successful is then you said the, the sales went down was the the imposter syndrome at the point at the highest point and that's what I think it was after because the podcast business out and the shirt sales business out happened at the same time okay or at least for me it felt like it was at the same time okay. so it's me grappling with failure like true failure for the first time in my life yeah and then it's me still seeing the you know the success of others yeah and at that time i didn't have the mindset that i do now yeah i didn't understand that failures aren't failures failures are just lessons that turn into blessings because it gives you the roadmap to get to the success you want yeah i didn't understand it back then so and i didn't understand just the power of failing forward Mm -hmm. and that if you truly want success you're gonna have to bump your head sometimes because you have to figure out what works for you and what doesn't work. Exactly. <laughs> and it, and it's funny because now I think back to like Einstein and like all his discoveries. And one thing Einstein always said was, "It's not that I fail x amount of times. I just learn all these different ways that didn't work." Yes. And it's the mindset you have to have. Exactly. But I ain't had it, so <laughs> so I didn't have the mindset. <laughs> so I was just really down on myself. And then seeing the success of, you know, the ones I get inspired by, I just felt like, man, I don't know. I don't think I, I don't think I'm meant to do this entrepreneurship stuff. I think I'm, I should just work the nine to five and just be happy mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. Um, because when, when I was at the pool store, well, I, I will say it, I did work 40 hours a week. It just went, it fluctuated because it was retail. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I, I just thought that, yeah, I should just do this. I should just be cool with doing my 40 hours a week, getting my paycheck, going home, and like, that's it. Mm -hmm. And for the period that I was, you know, dealing with my imposter syndrome and just the mental blocks I had, it's it's just wild. Like, it's just interesting because the whole time I'm doing that, like, I was feeling unfulfilled on the inside. Like, I'm smiling on the outside, but I was so unfulfilled just because I knew I was meant for more. Mm-hmm. I knew I could do more. Mm-hmm. I knew that what I embarked on, this entrepreneurship thing, like I knew I'm I was meant to do it. It's just I didn't I, I just didn't have the right information. Yeah. Um what do your parents do? So my parents, both of them, uh they work nine to fives. My mom is a her teacher and my dad he works um, for the state, but he did. He works with computers. That's probably where where I even got just my love for tech and stuff. Cause yeah. He he um, graduated from college with a degree in like math, computer science. So he was yeah. But they're the truth though. I love them. I love it. Okay. So um, the reason I ask is because um, of course, like our parents, a lot of times influence yeah. our journey, and then kind of going back to your mm-hmm. first entrepreneurial and en- entrepreneurial en- endeavor you were were um in college mm-hmm. what was your major then so in college well i started out hey guys it's ariel from the work and play podcast if you're getting any value from this channel and i mean anything from the tutorials to the podcast to the random videos that you see on this channel then i just ask that you do one thing please subscribe subscribe and share this to anyone that you think this resonates with and drop a comment below so i know what other things that you want to see next now let's get back to the episode uh well i said i started out but the summer before my freshman year um i was a political science major because i grew up thinking i wanted to be a lawyer got you know graduated high school and realized i'm really not trying to take the bar i'm not trying <laughs> to go to law school mm-hmm. i don't want to be a lawyer for real mm-hmm. so i was like okay what what am i gonna do next and at that time which is funny because if i could go back although 
Well, yeah, I'm just saying. If I could go back, I probably would just study business. But I didn't have just the entrepreneur. It wasn't fully just developed yet that I yeah. wanted to go. Mm -hmm. But um, the next best thing for me was mass communications. Because okay. I've always been uh, just a great communicator. Like, I'm very um, extroverted. Like, I love meeting new people. Like, you put me in front of a crowd, I don't get scared. Like, I, I actually enjoy it. And it's funny because my mom uh, told me that I've been that way since I was a child. Like, you know, um, at our church, we used to have the um, different programs like Easter program, Christmas program. And I would like all the other kids. Well, not everybody, but most of the kids, you know, they get up there, they get, you know, stage fright. Mm -hmm. Me, no, like I'm, I deliver <laughs> and I execute so much so where when I was little, like, they give us age appropriate like speeches, mm -hmm. but just because of just my just me, I get I call it my just because it's me. I got like the speeches that the older kids would get, mm -hmm. but that's because they knew I would deliver that sucker. Like yeah. it could be two, three times the length of the other kids my age, but I was gonna execute because I just never been. I've never been one to be afraid of like the spotlight. I actually revel in it. Like I just. Because to me, it's like go time. And yeah. Especially now, like, that I have this mindset and I just understand my value. Because when, earlier when you talked about um, understanding the value, that's another thing I re just reflected on the journey that I didn't truly do. I, I didn't truly value myself the way that, uh, like, other people saw the value in me. Mm -hmm. Of course, managers see the value in you. I didn't see it in me. Yes. And... And it's interesting, though, because in me not seeing my value, it's not that I didn't think I was, like, good, because I, I get results. Like, mm -hmm. I knew I could do, you know, whatever the job was. Mm -hmm. But I understand now that just, like, with my brand, like, I am amazing at everything I do. Like, the whether it's social media content creation, it's podcasting, like, yeah. I'm just amazing. And I need to... Be confident in that because it's not cockiness to be confident in right. yourself and to yes. truly value yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you just now it makes sense. So you were mass communication in, yeah, in undergrad. Mass communication. So that mm -hmm. that ties in the marketing now, mm -hmm. and then that also ties in your your podcasting. Yep. So um, and then you, I'm so glad you reflect you reflected mm -hmm. in this moment because, um. Other people can say you're amazing from high school, yeah. but it's not until we believe in ourselves exactly. that we actually go out and we start making investments in ourselves because we yes. know we're worth it. Exactly. So I'm curious when it comes from your to your from your client's perspective, mm -hmm. what do you do like to help them get through their journey of mm -hmm. And, and then you have to help me understand what their journey is. Do they go from like um, entrepreneur doing like a product based business to a podcast or is it like someone going so, from a nine to five to a podcast? So for me, well, at least what I'm starting out with is service based entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is, is because most service, well, when it comes to service based entrepreneur, most times they're the ones doing the work. Yeah. So in order for people like, well, I guess when it comes to entrepreneurship, well, really just a product when you're selling a product or service in general people got to have that klt factor you know they got to know like and trust you mm -hmm. and if you have a service-based business you want to build that trust as much trust with your consumer as possible because that's who's gonna you know invest in themselves through you know purchasing your service mm -hmm. so it's though well that's why I, um that's why i, I like to help service-based entrepreneurs and it's because it's easier to establish yourself as an authority when you have the content to support it. Yeah. So just like with you, you have um, people that are transitioning from employee to entrepreneur. The reason people trust you and they like they know you, they like you and they trust you is because you have the content to support the knowledge that you have. Mm -hmm. Like if I don't, if I never hear you talk about what you know, yeah. I don't know that you know it. Mm -hmm. And you may. You may talk about it, but there's this other person out here that's talking, and they're more certain when they speak. They speak with authority. They speak with confidence. They know that their product is valuable and that 
and it, it's to the point where they're not even selling you mm -hmm. on the product or service that they're offering. They're, they're giving you the opportunity to invest in yourself to get the result that you want. That you need. Mm -hmm. I love it. So what it sounds like is you're going to help service-based businesses communicate their value consistently mm -hmm. and create a podcast yep. that is the content that mm -hmm. creates the, that validity. Yep. Okay. And it's like, basically, it's like, uh, I guess speaking it feels like a funnel because i think like a funnel mm -hmm. um now when it just comes to my approach to social media mm -hmm. but the podcast is like a lead generation tool like that's the place where you bring people in so they can hear your like they can hear you and on the podcast that's when you you know you educate the people mm -hmm. because it people and i learned this from gary v this strategy it's like the jab 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 right hook but it's where you give people so much free what we call now free game yeah to where it's like it's a no like when they're ready to invest in themselves they're coming to you because yeah. you're the one who's giving them some tangible things that they could do mm -hmm. and that they have implemented and got success so it's like if i've learned all like i'm gonna use you for example if i learned all this from REL for free mm -hmm. i know for a fact when i invest in her program i'm gonna get 10 times the results yes. so yeah that's 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 why um I'm offering that, and that's why I want to help service-based entrepreneurs, just because podcasting is so powerful. It is so powerful. It is so powerful. I just can't emphasize it enough. Oh, okay. So another thing that I, so it's really clear mm -hmm. uh, how you're going to get um, service-based businesses who haven't necessarily started talking about themselves and putting mm -hmm. themselves out front how to do it. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I'm really curious about is you being from Mississippi. Yeah. So I don't know a lot of entrepreneurs from Mississippi, um, but growing up in Atlanta, we always, and this is literally just because of how limited mm -hmm. black history is yeah. in, in schools in the South, you always think, I think the one thing I thought about in Mississippi was that they had abolished slavery sometime when I was in high school. So my thoughts, my thought about like being an entrepreneur yeah. in Mississippi, what is yeah. that like? Oh man, I gotta adjust myself. <laughs> okay, so first off, I am so proud to be a Mississippi. Really? And I'm especially proud to be from Jackson, Mississippi. Like I've been born, raised, paid in Jackson. Like Jackson made me who I am. Like the grit, the tenacity, the passion that I have, it was all developed in Jackson. So. Being from Mississippi is, it's special because to make, like it's, I'm not gonna lie, it's tough to make it out of Mississippi. Um, just because the mindset, the environment, like it's, it's not always the most conducive to, you know, it's not always the most conducive to helping you reach your success. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are people that defy the odds and I am so glad that they did because they were served as examples for me. Mm -hmm. Like there's people like Timothy Ory. Um, he actually uh, lived out here in Atlanta for a little bit, but um, it's him. He built the brand, uh, Clothes Minded Clothing. He showed me that, hey, you can build a successful clothing brand. There's people like Key Mark Kane. He's a speaker, poet, just awesome guy. He showed me you could do it. Uh, Miranda Joyner, like it, it, it's so many just giants to me that they like they show me it's possible like there's an artist um there's silas he's crushing it right now mm. uh, in the music industry and like but the guy that um i'm actually here with trey solo that like they're on the rise and they're literally on their journey to hitting the next level and it's just beautiful to see that i honestly it well one it's beautiful to see their journey but i believe the reason people from mississippi are like different and we're built different is it takes a certain amount of just pure just like belief in yourself and your craft and like whatever you're trying to give to the market mm. you have to be on point to get people to support you because really? yeah like and the reason is and i and of course the whole state isn't just it's not just riddled with poverty, like the whole state. Mm -hmm. But I'll say when you have so many people that are in positions where they're like they're focused on just feeding their family, like making sure they got enough to you know cover all their bills. 
if you as an entrepreneur is you have to be valuable you have to have your stuff on point because people literally are making those type of decisions like okay I, I want I see you got some value I want to support you okay I'm gonna take my time I'm gonna stack my money so that I can you know and it's like just and then just when it comes to just being a uh, black owned business like you know we're held at a whole other standard than you know most uh, companies so you just have to dot all the I's cross all the T's and things mm, of that nature mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I'll say being from Mississippi it's it's a blessing and but it, it definitely has its challenges as well, mm -hmm. which is why um, oftentimes you will see people from Mississippi, they will reach a certain level and then they'll leave. Mm -hmm. They'll go to Texas, Georgia, especially Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, they'll go to New York, which I don't fault them for because some opportunities you have to leave because you need to get in the right environment, which is in, information and environment are like two of the biggest things uh, to me. But um, you have to be in an environment that will help you succeed. Um, so, yeah, it, it's for me. It's a blessing uh, being from Mississippi, just because all just if I didn't have to go through the struggles I went through, it wouldn't have made me who I am today. I wouldn't be as passionate, as determined, as focused if I wasn't from Mississippi. Yeah, I asked that because so it's interesting. Um, you said you got to be on your p's and q's. Mm -hmm. Also, people. So, a per so growing up, mm -hmm. thinking about the Mississippian mindset, you would think that black people just don't support black people. But what one thing that I hear is, if a black person wants to support you, they're going to put you know as much effort as they can to invest in your business. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in Atlanta, sometimes I feel like if you sell too much in the black um, environment, I think you might end up saturating your own business with, with people who just want to support mm -hmm. they don't even realize they don't even necessarily like a, like a mississippian might say you have value i'll save my money to afford you mm -hmm. whereas sometimes just because you're in atlanta and it's a black business you might just get a customer but you can't mm -hmm. necessarily you can't predict yeah. based off of yeah. oh i just want to support a black business yeah. so i think there's there's sounds like a give and take when it comes yeah. to when, if you build yourself in Mississippi, you better make sure you're valuable. Yeah. Don't just call yourself a black black business and right. a, expect a Mississippian to even be able to afford you, much exactly. less see the value in you. Exactly. So it's less about, you know, Mississippians not supporting black businesses. It's just it's just a complete it's just a different yeah. mindset. I, honestly, that whole just people don't support people, stuff like that. I don't like that narrative mm -hmm. mainly because I believe the focus is in the wrong area. Mm -hmm. Instead of focusing on oh, this pe this person ain't support me. Oh, this group of people ain't supporting me. Mm -hmm. I believe the focus should be on just being as valuable as, as you possible Ooh. and focusing on impact. Like when you focus on the impact, the income will come. Literally, income it will come in. But you need to first be impactful. You need to first be valuable because you have to realize when people purchase your product or their service, they are literally taking their own resources and giving it to you and saying, hey, I believe that this will help my situation. Yeah. Even if it's like a t-shirt brand, I'm getting your t-shirt because it's going to help me be fly. It's going to help me be fresh. Yeah. Or it could be like an intrinsic thing. Like it's, that's why I love Dave's brand. Because um, as an entrepreneur, like we believe in ourselves, we know that yeah. we will sacrifice sleep to make our dreams come true. Yeah. So when we get like a T-shirt, it's more so because the message resonates on the inside yes. of us. So it's, I believe people, instead of focusing on the support, they should focus on their impact. Because if you are impactful mm -hmm. and you're giving out value, it, like if you're consistent, and that's another thing. You have to be consistent, which mm -hmm. was, and it's funny because consistency was literally, that's like, that has been my Achilles heel, like my tragic flaw. The one thing I believe, aside from dealing with the imposter syndrome, the mental blocks, all that stuff, it's the consistency. Mm -hmm. But, and, oh, I'm going to get it. So, focus on impact, focus on value, be consistent, and the support is going to be there. 
Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. Now, you, you were on a roll, so I was going to follow you wherever you I'm went not, with that hey, consistency. Hey, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, it's, so, <laughs> so the funny thing, so you went back to that time where you, you kind of experienced the, well, less inconsistency mm-hmm. and the imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. But you also mentioned something that's really dope, which is you met your wife. Yes. Yes. And it is a funny story. <laughs> I love wife. funny stories. So, the, it, which, <laughs> I love you, baby. But I got I to gotta tell you. So, literally, so it's 2020, right? It's January 15th of 2020. I was in a relationship uh, with a, a young lady, awesome, awesome person, but we had been going through some challenges uh, for some months. We tried working it out. It just was not meant for us to, you know, still continue down that journey. So we ended up calling it quits on the 15th of January, mm-hmm. right? Literally seven days later, I meet my wife. Ain't that amazing? Now, the, so just uh, th- that alone, like, God, great, right? Mm-hmm. He built the work. And it's funny because it's at first when we started dating, the joke I was telling my wife was, you know, God created the world in seven days, and in seven days he changed my world, and I met you. She was like, oh. <laughs> oh. But it's true. Like, God literally changed my life in seven days. But um, just, and it's funny, though, because we, um, had like our first date, um, really the day we uh connected because you know I got a number, um, because you know, well, I'm not even gonna do that, like, I ain't gonna front, <laughs> but you know, she, you know, she gave me, you know, I, I approached her, you know, she did give me her number, and then I'm the type of person where I believe in seizing opportunities when they like arrive in the power of now, so she, through us just talking throughout the day. Um, we realized that we had some free time that same day. So mm-hmm. I came up to her apartment and she made, she was make, she was cooking dinner for her friend, like her roommates who were also her friends. Um, and she invited me to come over. So I went over and it's just, it's funny looking back because I remember sitting at the table and then she was like telling everybody to come to the dinner table because the food's done and all that good jazz. And I remember going to, I was about to walk in the kitchen and make my plate. And she was like, no, like, sit down. Like, <laughs> sir, you're a guest. So I was like, okay, hey, say less. I'm going to sit down. Yeah. So she like, you know, make the plate for me. And the, well, that was like the thing number one that like caught my attention. Because it's like, hmm, okay, I like this. I like this energy. So after, after we had dinner, uh, we literally sat at the dinner table for like two, three hours just talking. Like just having just real deep, raw, just conversation. Mm-hmm. And she had um, the vinyl uh, player going. So she's playing Lauren Hill. And I've loved Lauren Hill since I was a baby. Like, every, cause yeah, I was born in 94. So as long as I can remember hearing music, I heard, I've heard Lauren Hill. And then not only that, she got me cause she played J. Cole on the vinyl, and I'm like a huge J. Cole. On the vinyl? Yes, she had uh, the Forest Hill Drive one. That's the um, that's the record she was playing. So we, wow. mind you, we're having this deep, just, we're like having this honest talk, and we're really connecting, and I hear, you know, the music, so I'm like, well, you don't know nothing about Lauren. And then she played with J. Cole. I'm like, you don't know nothing about J. Cole. <laughs> and she's like, sir, like, you don't know nothing about him. Like, I I love them. So we bonded over just our love for music. And then I think what was truly just special to me was the fact that we both were our authentic self from day one. Like most times when you meet people, you're getting like the skeleton, like you're getting the mask, you're getting the facade. Yeah. Because, you know, we're trying to make the best impression possible. But uh, with me, me and her, when we uh, connected, we were just our most authentic self. And also, I was saying, at that point in time, um, I was at, like, one of my lowest. Well, I won't say, when I say my lowest, it's, like, financially. I was just in my transition period, mm-hmm. just trying to figure stuff out and mm-hmm. be, um, just make my situation better. But I was at the beginning of it. Mm-hmm. So when we connected in, like, the days after that first date, because we considered our first date, but the days after that, um, I just let her, I put, I basically put all my cards on the table. I was like, so, hey, this is who I am. This is my situation. This is the stuff that's not looking the best right now. 
but I'm working on it and I'm going to make it happen. And How does she receive that? She like she supported instantly. Like was she an is she an entrepreneur as well? She's not. Okay. But um, she's an educator. Mm -hmm. um, so you know she's teaching the bright young minds of tomorrow. Yes. But um, what I will say is she under she understands just the entrepreneurial mindset. Love it. Which is amazing, just because I understand the challenge of being an entrepreneur and dating and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So being able to find her and she understands just like, there are some days, right, where I'll go really, really hard for the business, whether it's staying up a little bit late to edit a podcast or, you know, little small stuff like that. And she like understands and she never tries to make me feel bad or like try to limit me when it comes to my business endeavors. In fact, she like supports me. Yeah. Like even now, like here recording this podcast with you, I like this was the first time since we've been married. Cause that's another thing. We met January twenty second, twenty twenty. Yeah. And we got married November twenty first of twenty okay. twenty. Okay. Which in itself, I know. Wow. The the reason is why because on the fifteenth when the the last relationship ended, I told myself. And I told God, I was like, God, I ain't dating nobody else for the rest of this year. I'm just going to focus on me. Yeah. God was like, hi, you think? Yeah, you, yeah. You think you got a plan? I'm about to change your life. Boy. Yeah. And I ain't even had no idea. And, wow. But I'll say, one, we, uh, well, I had to skip through quarantine because COVID happened. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we get together on, uh, well, we. That January 22nd, by February 22nd, we were official, you know, like boyfriend, girlfriend. I popped the question. Well, you know, <laughs> will you be my girlfriend? Cause that's, yeah. That's just how I was raised. We, we officially asked, you know. And you sound, like, you sound like a sweet Southern boy. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. Southern so boy. that's, a, oh, that's yeah. a milestone. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny uh, how I did it, right? So um, at that time, she was a server at this restaurant. And she worked really late. I think she didn't get off to like 11. And then her coworkers, they went out. So she was just being a good, you know, friend and going out with them. And she came home, I think like close 12, 31 o'clock. I know it was late, whatever time it was. And leading up to that day, the 22nd, cause I already knew she was gonna be my girlfriend. Like I already knew she wasn't going nowhere. Cause she, <laughs> but um, I, I had been thinking for like weeks trying to figure out how I'm going to do this question, like how I'm going to pop the question. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll take her to dinner and do the, you know, the with the dessert app where you be my girlfriend and chocolate syrup. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I could do that. Or I could do like this big luxury picnic type setup and do it there. But then my mom's like, nah, do something that's going to completely shock her. So what I did was I knew she was working late already to 11 because she had to work a double that day. And at that, at that, Point, like it was just normal for me to just come over and her roommates would let me in, not just you know chill in her room until she got home. Mm -hmm. But on this day, what I did, well on this specific evening, I went, I did her laundry for her, I cleaned the kitchen, and I was doing the dishes when she was walking in. And like after she sit, you know she sits down and I'm like <sighs> decompress just from work. Uh, I was like, hey, I got a question for you. She's like, what? I was like, you know, will you be my girlfriend? And she was like, of course. Mm. And then, oh, I also had the bubble bath running for her too. Cause as a server, I just understand like, you're on your feet all day. You're going to be tired. You want to relax. Yeah. So my goal was the best way for me to pop the question is to truly show you and put the action behind. Like I'm here for you. I support you. And like, I love you. Which is funny now cause I realized now I realize I've loved her since the like even in the yeah. early uh, days of our relationship. relationship. I know your love language has to your one top one or two has to be acts of service. I know yeah, it is. I think that well the way I show it is yes, the acts, acts of service. service. Like because I don't know it, and I don't well I even in reading uh, the book the five love languages which is funny because we did premarital counseling and we read the book. I'm so glad we read it. Because that book is phenomenal. I honestly believe, which when me and her talk about this, I, sometimes I feel like I'm doing the most. But I honestly feel like everyone that's in a relationship should read that book mm -hmm. because it teaches what the biggest lesson to me from the five love languages is. Yes, you love your partner, but 
what matters more is showing your love in the way that they receive it best. Yes. So um, just, yeah, acts of service is how I like to show mm -hmm. my love. But uh, like how I like to receive it is just the quality time of words of affirmation. Mm. And that was something, that was another reason I knew like, she was the one. Yeah, I love the way you you invested so much time in popping the question uh, to be your girlfriend. So I know that the marriage one was a milestone. But what's really, really, really profound mm -hmm. about you connecting with your wife at the time mm -hmm. that you did is when you talk about your entrepreneurship, your mm -hmm. your momentum was at a at a low point, yes. and you met your wife at a place where she was accepting of you. And you said the biggest thing that was that allowed you guys to connect was you were your authentic self, which allows you to continue to explore that entrepreneurship. And in this last stint, Lord willing, this will be your like yeah. your your momentum to yes. literally leave that nine to five. Yes. Because I think it's literally the plan right now. Yeah. Man, it's just I, being patient because yeah. especially as an entrepreneur, <clears throat> it's, as an entrepreneur, you know, we have the mindset. We know where we want to go. Yeah. We know that the end point yeah but you can't skip the process yeah and you can't skip the small steps mm -hmm. so although you may want to leave the nine to five today hold up pump your brakes pump your brakes yes because you got to make sure you have a plan of action now of course you will see uh some people in, in their journey it, it they had to leave immediately mm -hmm. but i would say just for any entrepreneur out there just examine your situation and under, make sure you make the best decision for you. Absolutely. I think an exit strategy mm -hmm. will give you the freedom to quit your job whenever you want. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you ever it's like that. It's like that hazard button. Like, yeah. you know, when you need to press it, but you may not never have to you may exactly. never have to press it. But just in case you need to have that exit strategy together because it's going to it's going to come in. It, it may come in handy. Yeah. So I have thoroughly enjoyed your story oh, yeah. um, from literally like from college all the way to now, you being able to manage two jobs and now you have your, your amazing wife, amazing. Yes, yes. Um, and what I really, what I resonate with most about your story is when I was in college, I used to tell myself that I was average. I used to literally say, everything about you is average. It's really actually interesting that I mean, like everything was great on a bell curve at the time. So I was like, as long as I'm average, I'm good. My health, I thought was average. So I said, well, there's nothing really amazing about you. However, you're safe. I mean, it's not like you're bad. But I think where this all comes full circle is just how we connected. One, you made me feel so, you know, you, it's kind of like that external validation, which like pulls out some of the things that I feel like I'm good at. And then also just your brand, like right. you, the shirt you decided to choose today, mm -hmm. and then hearing your story and how it evolved from college, mm -hmm. everything just comes full circle as I'm listening to your story. Yeah. So one of the things that I like to do on the show is like, I like to, to give back. I like to reach back okay. to a person who is listening to your journey and some is, is somewhere resonating with part of mm -hmm. your story. And I can only imagine if I had heard your story today, maybe I would have changed my mind you know, or sooner, but for some reason, like things have like seeds have been planted and I've started to come out of my cocoon way like, at, at the right time. But if you could choose your words mm -hmm. to inspire someone who's on their journey, um, if you take a moment, what would those words be? Mm, I just need four. <sighs> <laughs> you are not average. I need you to say that to yourself. You are not average. Greatness is within you. You are a wonderful creation from God. There are things inside of you that you don't even realize will change your life if you have zero doubt belief in yourself. Do not let anyone, anything, not even yourself, stop you on your journey to what you're trying to do. Whatever your goal is, whatever that dream is, whether it's getting the six-figure career, whether it's being a music artist and taking it to the highest level, no matter what you're trying to do in life, you can achieve it. But first, you have to believe in yourself with zero doubt. Because yes, you can believe in yourself, but still doubt yourself. You have to have zero doubt. That's first. Have zero doubt, believe. And then next, you have to execute. And then get in the right information and get in the right environments and just put in the work. And I promise you, I kid you not everything will change for you 
100 yeah. percent whoo now you've already said it earlier in the in the episode but i definitely want you to tell us if the people in the room connect with you how can or connect with your story and their in your journey how can they get connected with you in real life okay so if you want to get connected with me in real life just you can hit me up on all social media platforms at henry amazing that's henry h-e-n-r-y a-m-a-z-i-n and you know if you're ever interested in trying to just work through social media content creation podcasting just shoot me a dm and we can make it work as a matter of fact once um this course is available his link is going to be available can we do something special for my yeah, listener yeah, yeah. So, okay perfect so the link is actually going to be in the description below you can check that out as soon as this episode drops thank y'all so much for listening thank you for watching you heard what the man said go out be great you are not average yes. thank y'all so much until next time peace out